how would she organize? So um, over the last few weeks, I've been trying to put it in order. It's like trying to decide what is it I know and how do I know it? And uh, did I learn this? Did I observe it or did I just make it up? So there'll be some of that throughout the evening. Some of it made up or? or... Yeah, yeah. So you got to figure it out, which is made up and which is real. Okay. So what are the order of process tonight is to do this intro, then we're going to do goals, a disclaimer, the strategies to identify trees, um, and then the characteristics that we're talking about, and then give you some homework. So we think you guys are here because you're curious about the natural systems. And you know, in everything that we do, whenever we're dealing with people, um, it's amazing. The more you know about the natural world, the more, the more you realize you don't know very much and the curiosity. And to establish wonder is, is the most powerful thing that we can do, any of us can do is, is um, encourage people to wonder about stuff. So, but tonight we're gonna focus on strategies to identify winter trees. And for us, success will be when you guys take what we say and, uh, and then you go out and look. The idea is like trees, like everything else, if you learn three, then you go and you learn one more. This is kind of like that, but different. Okay, so right now, Cindy prompted you to write down, uh, to think about goals. So write down two goals for yourself for tonight. So realistic and manageable, so two goals. And um, Susan, you're gonna give me a thumbs up when you're ready to go. You're just gonna thumbs up right in front of your face so I'll know you're ready. Me? Yeah, you. Okay, I, I took off selfies, so I, I, I okay, can you okay. still see me there? Yeah, I can see you, you're good. Okay, I'm right. muted because my husband is working from home. He's no dead. worries. I understand. I have a husband who makes lots of noise too. So, <laughs> all right. So Susan says she's ready. So I'm going to see yeah. what everyone else is. So here's the disclaimer from Dave and about making up stuff. So, so, so uh, we're not renowned botanists. There's a lot of excellent botanists around Middle Tennessee. Mm -hmm. um, I I functionally shoot at the eighty percent level. Um, the upper 20%, it gets harder and harder and more detailed. And so tonight we're, we're going to talk in generalities. And please remember that in all things natural, exceptions rule, that we're going to talk about generalities and prejudices, and they don't always exist. So we'll warn you out throughout the night that that's true. Um, the simple thing is a, a yellow poplar tree growing on a, uh, a terrible site looks different than one that's growing on a good site in terms of form, in terms of habits and all that stuff. So that's what I want you to be aware of is we realize that there's some generalities and, and so uh, keep that in mind. The other thing is if you want a quick answer, just tell me what this is and move on. This is not gonna be fun for you. Okay. And so remember exceptions rule. So even though remember is spelled wrong, you still knew what that word was. So exceptions rule. <laughs> all right you can type in the chat any questions you have um our monitors are going to keep up with it and holler at us if we need to stop and identify with them so but right now i need you to list three trees that you can identify in winter and then once you do that thumbs up also you can make a note about how is it that you identify it?
Mm -hmm. Okay, you're watching it. So I'm seeing some great things in chat. Feel free, if there's more than one characteristic that you use for a tree to identify it in winter, feel free to write that down if you use more than one. Okay, I'm looking for a thumbs up from someone. Oh, we have another Susan. I didn't see a while ago. So, hi, other Susan. Are you ready to move on, other Susan? She is. She says yes. Okay. All right. So, here's the deal. This is this is how my brain works. When I identify a tree and, and the work that I've done in the field is almost always in this form. It's like I'm driving up on a tree, right? And so I go from very broad to very narrow, starting with the location. Where is it growing? Because things grow in associations. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. And I look at where is it growing? And then the form what shape how does it look so where is it growing is it a dry site is it facing south is it uh, uh really wet rich soil etc or is it in a highly urbanized area uh, yes so the next thing is form is how does it look what's its shape the, the third thing that i look at is habit and that's not a misspelling that's not habitat that's um what's weird about it what's interesting what's goofy about it then I look at the bark, then the branching pattern. How does it hold its branches? Um, then if it's got any leaves hanging on, then twigs, buds, and fruit or flowers. So I do this uh, any time of the year when I'm looking. It's, it just happens for me, very broad to very narrow. And the words twigs and buds are highlighted. Um, for you to know that we're aware that most people that do winter tree identification focus on twigs and buds and they don't do much with the other things and so we're going to touch on those um but but i wanted you to think about the other parts too all right so trees grow in associations and in a neighborhood is an association that means um where you find a one tree, chances are you're going to find several of those. And there's going to be five or eight different species growing together in an association. Usually there's not 25 trees growing in an association. So, um, so once you get to looking at trees, you just look around and you'll see the same thing over and over again. And I bet if you drive through your neighborhood, you can look around very quickly and see that the same tree is planted over and over and over again. And there may be, there may be half a dozen different species, but principally you're going to run into a small number. Um, another strategy is when you're thinking about identifying trees is, is think about if you eliminate what it's not, you know that it's not uh, something. And then um, when you're lost in thinking about it, um, I like to think about what are the three possibilities of this tree and then start to think about the criteria. So no matter what you do, generally uh, until you get fruit or uh, the flowers, you're not looking at one piece of evidence. You're looking at a preponderance of evidence. It's like some characteristics um, are housed in a bunch of different trees to say that a tree has a a large bark that's gray will cover a ton of trees. But um, so you look at the preponderance of evidence that you can find. And the last thing that's most important is um, if you look at this graph, this is the uh, forest inventory and analysis data of, of people that measure the forests of Tennessee every, every 10 years. And, and so red maple is the most common tree in the woods. Um, so if you look at those um, that surveys, 80% of the trees in Tennessee are, are just these species that I've got listed. So if you know maples, oaks, hickories, yellow poplar, pines, ashes, those guys, you know most of the trees. Unfortunately, a lot of people want to know the odd stuff, what, what's not those, or, or fortunately, because it's interesting to chase those too. So the first criteria that I look at is location. That means 
the geography, what's the soil like, how much water is available in the sun. Is it, is it on a north facing slope, a south facing slope? Is it on the edge of a road or opening? And so the core principle here and the core prejudice is bald cypress and black willow and alders grow near water. You know, so if you're near water, you're looking, you're expecting to find those kinds of trees. And likewise, um, if you're if you're on top of one of the highest peaks in on the Smokies, you might be finding red spruce and Fraser fir. Now, red spruce and Fraser fir don't grow there because they like to grow there. Just as red cedar, oftentimes we hear the term red cedar likes to grow on glades. Well, it's my um, thesis that red cedar can tolerate glades and that red spruce and Fraser fir can tolerate the harsh environments of those high mountains. Um, so it's not that they really like to grow there. You can grow red spruce and Fraser fir in <clears throat> more soils than in other places, but other species can outcompete them there. Same with red cedar. If you plant it in a well-drained deep soil, it'll grow like a weed and it, it'll grow, um, grow well. <coughs> so remember, um, exceptions rule and people take plants everywhere. Check so whenever you're looking up a, a tree and you think you found something, especially with leaves or something, check the range map and make sure that it naturally grows there or that you're in a place where somebody might have planted it. I, I just put this in here so you would have uh, a list of species that I, I found this in, in getting ready for this and thought it was pretty handy. Um, so you'll notice in it that some of the species are in all three, the well-drained, deep, um, moist areas and the dry ridge too. So some people are, are uh, some trees are more specific about their habitat requirements. Anything else? Okay, the next thing uh, is form. And I'm wondering um, if this is uh, very common to you guys. I think that if I say, think of a short lollipop shaped tree with white spring flowers, Everybody will know that. Raise your hand if you know uh, a short lollipop tree with white spring flowers. Um, and we tend to know those by shape. So Bradford pear um, is a lollipop shaped tree. And, and so by the form of that is um, interesting. And if, you, if you're familiar with um, Bradford pear, um, it's interesting to look at those shapes and understand that we like them because we can plant them in rows and they all look the same. But most trees, you can't identify the species just by the, the shape of it, but some you can. Some you can get to very quickly. Um, this picture that's the center tree picture, the, the tallest one, um, this is the this is a typical the right um, pyramid shape. Okay, notice the strong central uh, trunk and then the, um, the angle that the branches are coming out of. It's not all that steep. Um, this is a bald cypress tree. They look like this, especially when they're open grown and young ones. Okay, so the shapes of trees and the forms of trees is different if they're an open grown tree or they're competing for sunlight. But very typical, uh, very typical bald cypress. So if you see a pyramid shape immediately, if I see one, I immediately sweet gum or bald cypress comes to mind. Um, the next thing is the lower right hand corner, um, that base shape that elms do that big strong uh, trunk that moves up and out is a vase shape um, and elms do that a lot. A lot of maples tend to have a vase shape um, um, but um, you can't identify any single tree but you can eliminate a lot by the shape. 
Um, and then there's the size. There's a whole bunch of uh, of small size trees that grow around. Um, if you look at the oops, that that the third picture that I've got here, it's kind of a that's the definition of an oval shape. So yeah, the one in the middle is a Bradford pear. Um, you can see the little um, line drawing of different shapes that people use to to identify trees. So so when you're identifying trees, the, the form can help you. It can eliminate a lot. Okay, stop at this point. Go back one. Um, stop at this point. Think about the, the one or two or three trees that you can already identify in the winter. Think about the location. Is that one of the things you wrote down for your trees? Where it's growing? Does that help you? Uh, think about its form. Is it the shape or the form that helps you to identify that tree? If you didn't write location or form down for your trees, think about where they are found growing. Think about that form and make a notation to yourself because you already know that, you just might not have thought about it as one of the characteristics that you use. So um, I'm gonna take a minute or give you a minute to think about location, where those trees grow and form of those trees that you can already identify. So let me give you a, a couple of, uh, let me give you just a minute to do that. Make a notation in your notes. Okay, the next characteristic would be habit, not habitat. So thanks, Dave. All right. This is the interesting thing, and Cindy warns me that not everybody pays attention to this, that, that that's um, something that that's, if you've got a crooked mind, this is the way you see the world. But functionally, it's, it's an inclination to chase light. So the, the trunk and the limbs uh, main, focus, main function is to get the leaves in the light to produce sugar, sugar water. Okay, so some trees have different habits and you can identify them or pick them um, out. So this business of holding dead leaves longer than others, this, the picture on the bottom, that the copper color picture um, is a typical uh, winter scene in Middle Tennessee, uh, in East Tennessee, um, probably in East Tennessee, you'd see a little more pines in it. But, um, but generally speaking, in a in a uh, mid slope kind of average sort of forest, those trees with leaves are either going to be beech, hop hornbeam, or oaks. Um, those are the ones that hang on to their leaves late. Now, remember the idea that exceptions rule. So right across the street from our house right now, there is a maple tree that's hanging on to its leaves. Okay. And that is strange and odd. And there are some, there's a few other maples around that have them. But, but when you walk through the woods, uh, beech, hop hornbeam, and oaks are, are the common ones with their leaves. Um, some trees are naturally, naturally have their roots grown on top of the ground. Uh, anybody that's planted a silver maple know that. And uh, silver maple are, tend to be wet species. They, they're native to wet areas, and that's a function of, um, function of dealing with the absence of uh, oxygen in the roots. So uh, some, have, some trees have th that characteristic. Um, the inclination to sprout. If you're walking through the woods and you see a bunch of small trees around a big tree and they're all the same size and they're all popping up, um, that demonstrates um, the inclination to sprout. If you find one pawpaw, chances are you're going to find a bunch. There's a bunch that'll sprout around. And if you try to kill a pawpaw, you're going to have a bunch sprout up around you. The same with a lanthus. If you're one of those normal people that are working to eradicate invasive species, you know this about a lanthus. It sprouts like crazy. The same is true with black locust. And black locust is a hoop because 
in the 50s and 60s, foresters encouraged people to plant black locusts in their in their wood lots to uh, to make firewood because they have a high BTU content and uh, especially west of here. And those dudes sprout like crazy. And so you can overrun your forest with black locusts and have too many and they'd be an irritant. Another cool characteristic is, uh, is the tree on the right, the evergreen tree on the right. If you notice the very top leader, it droops to the side. And if you drive through your neighborhood or around the town and you look at evergreen trees, if you look at the top leader, the one with the drooping leader is going to be a hemlock. It's just, that's what they do. Um, and some trees like sourwood, the tree in the middle, lower, small tree that's got really crooked uh, secondary limbs or, or first order limbs are uh, sourwoods. You can walk through the woods and see the sourwoods from a quarter mile away because they seem like they, they turn left for no apparent reason. They grow crooked all over the place. And the other one that that it's got the cool habit is a favorite of mine on the far left is a persimmon. Persimmons tend to be small trees that grow straight, have no crown, uh, maybe twist a little bit to the light, but but they have that that thick uh, blocky bark, dark blocky bark but they're small trees and they shoot straight up, no limbs. Um, so that's, a, that's an odd habit. You can identify a lot of trees, um, yeah, by their appearance, and you don't have to look very closely to see it. You just have to pay attention to their, their personalities. Okay, the other thing is, is bark. This one, every time we do a workshop uh, or, a training session, people say, I can, I'm pretty good with, with leaves, but I don't know how to identify a tree by its bark. And of course, um, you really can. It's not that hard. It, it's hard to compare it. It's just hard to remember because a lot of trees have the same, have a, a, a furrowed bark that's, that's gray. And, and some, it's hard to tell one from the other just by the bark. Um, and the way the light is hitting the bark makes a big difference. So, but the core principle with, with bark, bark is like our skin. When we're young, it's smooth and flawless. As we get older, it gets cracked and rough. But some trees have smooth bark at, at maturity, like the, um, the greenish white um, tree right here. American beech, I don't know if, how familiar you are with this. this, is a beech tree. This is the one that, that implores you to carve your initials and your sweetheart's initials in the tree with a little heart, right? We don't recommend that, but in parks and stuff, um, you used to be able to find people's initials all over the place. They stay smooth um, all their lives. Also, um, American holly will do that. It's uh, it's got the same, but you can't con you can't uh, confuse holly with beech because holly hangs onto its leaves all year long. And then another species that grows along creeks, uh, that's a small diameter tree, is that has the same kind of bark, but it's got a muscle like um like your forearm. It's got furrows um like a well muscled um. Bodybuilder. Body yeah. And they grow right next to the creeks. So those trees have smooth bark at, at, um, throughout their lifespan. So did you compare that tree? Okay. And so the, t the tree, the picture on the far right, that top one and the one right below it are both the bark of a cherry tree. The upper one is the new bark. It's got it's a very smooth bark and it's got little white lenticels. Those are gas exchange locations, locations on the tree. And it, it kind of uh, looks kind of ribbonish, but it's smooth. But as the tree ages, it goes to that 
burnt potato chip looking um, bark that is hard and dark. And so you can tell a cherry tree while you're driving down the road just by the bark of it. Got it? And, and so, so a lot of times if you look up in a tree, you'll see that the bark is smoother on the, uh, on the newer branches, the younger branches uh, versus the uh, trunk. And that can tell a lot. So you can identify a lot of trees by the, that have plated bark. A uh, shag bark hickory, most people can stumble across and see it. You don't have to look at it very close to see its plates and its all shagginess. Uh, the same with sycamore. The white bark that's plated usually glows around creeks. You can, you can see those from two blocks over. You can find those just um, so you don't have to look at the fine details of there. And honey locust, um, it's got a smooth bark uh, or plated bark. Um, and the coolest thing about that is it's got it's got uh, thorns. We'll talk about that in a minute. But um, a lot of some of the trees have warty bark. Hackberries, if you live in Middle Tennessee, uh, you're very familiar with how warty a hackberry tree is. But one of the coolest trees in the whole wide world has warts this little picture right next to the word toothache tree. This is what the bark of a, of a, a Hercules club or toothache tree. It's a small tree that um, grows in dry areas. And the cool thing is if you cut these little, cut the bark off or these little warts and you chew them, uh, it'll numb your mouth. So natives, natives used it. It's, um, it's called the toothache tree because it'll numb your mouth. And it's way fun when throughout my career, when I've stumbled on them, I, I cut the bark off of them and bring them and pay people to eat them just, just to watch them freak out. Um, so, so that's pretty cool. Um, the, the blocky dark persimmon bark, we saw that a minute ago. And then, uh, the furrowed, um, trees are the ones that are really hard to tell apart ash elm black locust they have that they're, they're all different but each one has a, a characteristic and it's really hard to describe them some trees have shaggy barks like like hop horn bean this one that is probably the most common tree in the woods in a dry woods that nobody knows it holds on to its leaves it, it its leaves look like an elm leaf it holds on to them uh during the winter and it's got a shaggy shaggy little strippy bark and it's real hard and uh uh it's a cool little tree and then uh a lot of people are familiar with the shaggy bark that comes with birches um river birch or black birch or sweet birch you know that peely bark that you think of indians making canoes out of uh in the in the new um in the lake states color can be an indicator um, orange is a prime example. If you see orange in the bark, um, chances are it could be an Osage orange or bodoc, that, that tree, or it's a mulberry tree. So, so when I'm walking up to a tree and I'm not even close to it, if I see that color, I'm already thinking that. So I've eliminated oaks, maples, ashes, and those kind of things, and already starting to think, is it this? The other characteristic that I think about that is not going to be any textbook. This one is one I made up, Karen. In terms of texture is uh, I learned uh, to tell white oaks from red oaks by climbing them. You know, if you're going to scrape your skin on it, it's a red oak tree. If it's going to cause dust to get in your eyes, it's a white oak tree. It's softer. And there, um, if you climb an ash tree, you're going to get dust in your eyes. It's got a softer bark. It's not, it's not hard. Okay, and then um, the next thing is a test, right? So we're focused at bark here. And so the test is how does a forester identify a dogwood tree? By its bark. bark. A dogwood so by its bark. 
if you don't remember anything else from this session, that will probably be it. This is a dad joke. <laughs> this is a place to stop. I took a, a look at some of the information in the chat, and I'm really impressed because you folks are, are right with us. Uh, think back to those two or three trees that you can identify in winter. Many of you have already talked about uh, bark. You've already talked about habit. Um, so look to your two or three trees that you said you can identify. Are there particular things about the bark, particular things about the habits, the, the odd thing about it that helps you remember it? And let's take you know 30 seconds to write those down or just jot those down before we move on, okay? Okay, Dave, let's move on. So the next thing, this is the one that very few people talk about, but you kind of have it in your mind. You, you notice this, but nobody talks about it. And it's and it's got some pretty interesting uh, math functioning to it is the branching pattern. And so how things branch. Um, the lower bottom tree uh, in this picture, you can see that base shape where the trunk is well-defined and it comes out to big first order branches, then the second order branches taper just a little bit all the way out. And so it's a fluid flow out of this vase shaped tree, this M. And you can see that they're going up and arcing out. Um, so the tree on the right of that, uh, it's got a main trunk. The first order branches are fairly defined. Maybe the second order branches are, are big enough but the twig, then immediately it goes to narrow, small twigs. And so that's the habit of a willow. And so just by looking at, at the branching pattern, you can see that's a willow. Now the upper right one is like a cool tree. This one is the, got a personality that goes from uh, the, the central main trunk is, is pretty straight and solid. And then the first order branches um, are thick, but then they get crooked. They get um, twisted and crooked and then go to small twigs. So sassafras does that. And so sassafras has also got the, in the furrows of the bark, it, it's a little bit red or orange color too, but it's more red than orange. But, but um, the habit of the tree just driving down the highway, when you see this in the trees, it can tell you that this is a sassafras tree. You got it? And then the lower left, this one should be one that many people from Middle Tennessee especially are familiar with. It's got, it's got the first order branches in it, and it's almost always a jumble of trees. It's, um, it's, it's a jumble of branches. And then the... Uh, second or third order branches almost always arc like this one. And so <clears throat> the one of the names that we have for this is, is Bodoc. Our, our colloquial common name is Bodoc. Well, it's a French word that is spelled B-O-I apostrophe S or, or B-O-I-S-D apostrophe A-R-C. It's the arc of the bow. So they named it after these arcs and they made bows out of it because of the natural grain of the wood arcs. And these are the ones that have those green hedge apple uh, brain looking things, right? Have thorns and their bark tends to be orange. <coughs> but, but you can notice this branching pattern from a long ways off, right? Okay. And then the, the center top picture, you can see that lolly sh pop shaped form. And if you notice, look at all of the branches. They tend to radiate out of the, um, out of the base of the tree, but they almost all go straight up. So this is that Bradford pear business. Those things go straight up. And because their branch, their branch angle is so steep, that's why they break apart. If you want to know more about 
the math of um, how tree branches work, it's it's really cool. This website on this on this slide, take a picture of it with your phone or check it out later. But but um, branch pattern is is really interesting and and it can be can be way overwhelming. And you don't have to get that that far into it, um, but but um, it's just interesting. Okay, so the next thing, and, and this is the most common thing that people teach when they're doing um, winter trees is, is realizing that, that some trees have opposite branching, some have alternate branching. Uh, opposite, uh, the branches are a function of the buds. So when buds are opposite, where you find one on a twig, exactly across from that is another one, these paired buds, they create limbs that are opposite branched limbs. So this dark picture on the right, you can see those nodes where, where there's a branch on the right, there's a branch on the left. Go up where there's a branch on the right, branch on the left. So this is a picture of an ash tree. They have thick, thick opposite branches. Now contrast that with the picture on the lower left. So those are alternate. They go up and out and up and out. So very few, um, most of the species are alternate. So a handful are opposite. And the opposite ones are maple, ash, dogwood, the Caprifoliaceae family, which is honeysuckle, the buckeyes, and the haws, uh, viburnums, um, if you're into scientific names. But um, Caprifoliaceae is the honeysuckle family. Um, so those are all opposite branches. And the way we remember that is um, the phrase madcap buck, maple ash, dogwood, Caprifoliaceae, buckeye. Um, and so uh, the other thing is, is some trees have whorls. They, instead of having two opposite, they'll have three. And if you find a tree with Three buds, three branches coming out of the same place. Likely, it's a catalpa. Okay. So think back to the trees that you know in winter. Think about their twigs or their buds. Are they opposite or alternate? In thinking about their branches, they should be the same. Although, although branches fall off, and it's a preponderance of evidence. Remember that. True. Okay, so leaves we're not going to deal with here. Just remind you that not all leaves are missing in the winter. There's the occasional leaf that hangs on a tree. And, uh, and then check the ground. So do you remember which are the most common trees that hang on to their leaves in the wintertime? What we talked about before? If not, you can watch this again and find out. <laughs> Or well, Karen, go put it in the chat. Beach hophorn beam and, and oaks do that. Oh, you said beach hophorn beam and oaks. Okay. All right, twigs are the next thing. So twigs are kind of cool. If uh, if you see wings on a on a twig like is in the upper left, chances are it's an elm, a sweet gum, or a bur oak. Um, so the amount of the the quantity of wings is a function of of moisture. Okay, some trees we identify simply by their color, the color of the twigs. Um, in the lower, the center picture on the bottom, that green sassafras or box elder does that. I was doing a, a, a project um, looking at people were, were flagging um, ash trees to, to worry about the emerald ash borer and uh, ashes are opposite branching. Box elder are maples and they're opposite branching too. And so people were tagging box elder trees, thinking that they were like they were ash trees because the bark's not that much different. But if you look at the twigs, you can tell very quickly that it's a box elder is it's a box elder because it's got a green twig. Thorns are way fun. Uh, on the right at the top, the paired thorns are a black locust. Nothing else does that. It's uh, those little tiny, they're little short 
tiny paired thorns. Um, so box, uh, I mean, black locust does that. The one below it on the bottom right, that real thorny is uh, honey locust. That's the one with the long beans that, that are spiral shaped. And then the coolest one is in the top center. Um, hawthorns have long buds like uh, sewing needles. And the coolest thing is, I mean, have thorns like that. And the coolest thing is they have buds right at the base of them. So, um, so if, show the base. Show the here's, base. The, here's the bud right here. Here's the bud, here's the bud, right at the base of the thorn. So um, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, stop areas, um, roadside uh, rest, stop. rest stops across Indiana, Ohio, and they planted uh, hawthorns, got little red, red berries for the birds, um, and they've got those all over the place. So next time you stop at one of those, look at the thorns. A different way to... Uh, Distinguish uh, trees by the twigs are is the pith on the lower left. That's the center cross section of the um, of the twig. Most piths are solid, but some are chambered or, or few. Only one is chambered, and that's a walnut. It's got little bitty. Uh, if you cut it with a knife, it's got little bitty cavities in there. Um, certain things have a uh, hollow pith, like. Um, like a royal polonia, um, bush honeysuckle. If you can't find, figure out what it is, break it open. It's got a hollow pith. And then some have, um, if you cut them, you see a star shape in the middle. That takes you to oaks. The very end of a twig, if you cut the end of a twig with a sharp knife, you'll see a, a star shape in the, in the middle of it. So that's pretty cool. So the other thing about twigs is they come in all sizes. And so this picture, um, we've got fat twigs. You see the penny in the picture on the lower left. And, and the um, fat twig that's an ailanthus on the, um, is A. And, and B is a sumac twig. So if you just glance at them and you're looking at size, they can look the same. But there are other characteristics that are um, different. <coughs> and then on the far right, you see um, uh, river birch, that fine, fine twig that's, Thank you, that's um, over here is a river birch. Okay, so in looking at this picture, can you find one tree that's got opposite branches? So smile to yourself when you do, because there's actually two up there. But if you can find, if you're an overachiever, you'll look for two. Look right here at J. You see where this branch comes out? That's pretty easy to see, right? You got that? And where there's a bud there, there's a bud there, there's a bud, 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 bud. You got that? Okay, and you can see where this branch was. This one broke off. This one developed. This one didn't. You see that? So it's a preponderance of evidence. You got it? You don't see that same thing here. These are alternate branches. These are alternate branches, alternate branches, alternate. <coughs> this one happens to be opposite branch too. You can't see it nearly as well. And dogwoods, um, that's a characteristic of dogwoods is you can't see it very well, but if you look at the bud scars in the buds, you'll see it. All right, the other thing is buds. We can identify lots of trees by buds. Here it is again, the alternate versus opposite. You see these opposite, alternate. Um, this bud right here, um, this terminal bud, ends up being a, a, a duck bill. So yellow poplar, our state tree does that. Um, and so these leaf scars that are on here, the shape of the leaf scars tell us all kinds of stuff about it. So when you get into identifying one tree from another, the leaf scars and then the, um, the vascular scars within those, that proximity tells you what it is. So um, buds make a difference.
You didn't talk about those oaks. All right, we'll talk about those in a second. Okay. Fruits, um, fruits and flowers are are the core place where we divided up our organizational structure. Just remember that if you find an acorn, it's an oak. If you find a helicopter, it's a maple. Boat paddles come from ashes. Elm, elms have little flying saucers like these, each one of these things. And these things are not very big. They're the tip of your little finger size. Uh, so elms make those little Samaras that look like flying saucers. And the legumes uh, have beans. So this one happens to be a red bud. But other legumes that we have are black locust, honey locust, uh, Kentucky coffee, mimosa. Those all make beans. So beans make are, are made by the legume family. Okay, and you can identify acorns by the shape and some characteristics of the acorns. Um, and then this cone thing in the middle is our state tree. That's the seed of our yellow poplar. Um, those things break apart and blow around their little seeds. And then this funky thing is a, a hop horn beam, this like uh, hops that we make beer out of. Here's a diagram with just different um, kinds of fruit from trees. All right, so that's general things. So if you get down to how do I identify uh, maples because if you can catch maples so the red lettering is um, what I go for is in maples they have opposite branches and usually the branches are are not very thick they're fairly thin a lot of the maples have red tip the new growth on the uh, branches is red helicopters tell you um, that they're maples, and maples tend to have light colored thin bark. It's not very thick, and it's sometimes it's furrowed and, and got strips in it when they get old, but it's mostly smooth. And here's a suggestion for you. Uh, if you want to do a screenshot of these next few slides, feel free to do that, or pull out your phone and take a picture of these next few slides. If you want to have a rule of thumb for maples and for oaks and those kinds of things. So that may be useful to you. So pardon me for interrupting. All right. So back to the branches. Um, the branch angles are steep in some maples or in most maples. And so that's why silver maples um, break apart as yard trees because these steep branch angles tend to break like the um, Bradford pear. They have steep branch angles. Um, that's what causes them to break. And uh, most maple wood that is, is soft and, and uh, easily broken, especially box elder. Ash trees, they have thick branches, thick twigs, opposite branches. You can see those from a long ways off. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, they have the burrows on the... Um, ash tree have V's or diamond shaped in them. And there's usually some white with them, but these, these diamond V's are pretty obvious. Um, a lot of other things kind of look like that, but, but not exactly. An interesting thing is the terminal bud, the very end bud of, of ashes look like a little Hershey's kiss. And the boat paddle seeds. So, um, Distinguishing green ash from white ash is all about the leaf scar. So this D shape tells us it's a green ash. And the C shape over here uh, tells us that it's a white ash, the backward C. And it's pretty handy if you have them, if you're looking at them, both of them together. But if you just got one tree, it's kind of hard to see if this line is exactly straight or not. So um, those are ashes. I look for the opposite branches, the thick, and, and they don't tend to have very spready crowns. They don't have, have very big crowns. So oaks, a lot of our forest is oaks. There's a mob of oaks. And the coolest thing I want you to know about here is clustered buds. The top three pictures are buds of different oak trees. See how the terminal bud has multiple buds at it? 
So if it's got multiple buds, it's an oak. So to me, it's just that's just it. I look for those clustered buds. And one somebody asked me one time, well, Dave, how many buds does it take to be clustered? And so I'm giving you these lower two right pictures. This right one um, looks kind of the same, uh, I, I suppose, in that it looks like it has multiple up there. But this twig tends to be thicker and darker. And if you cut the pith, this will be chambered. This is a walnut tree, this far right one. And it's got the bud scar has got a little monkey face down here at the bottom. You can see this little monkey face, but it doesn't do that in oaks. And then this is a maple. You can see it's opposite. It's got a terminal bud in two opposite ones. Um, so, so it's, it's not, not it's not an oak because it's opposite. Okay, and so if you cut these little twigs just below this, you'll see this star-shaped pith that's demonstrated down here. And so for oaks, the bark, there's nothing, nothing especially. It's kind of striped um, and plated. So, but I go to clustered buds, and clustered buds is, will get you to oaks every time. Hickories, these are trees with a hard bark. The platy, um, the platy bark of a shag bark hickory looks like this. Some of the other pig, pig nut and uh, some of the other hickories don't have these plates. Shell bark hickories got thinner plates. Um, they have big thick twigs. And some of the buds are big and fat like this one right here. Um, one of the, um, one of the, um, hickory some um, bitter nut hickory has a bright yellow pointed bud like this i mean you, you can see it you can notice the bright yellow on it <clears throat> but it's got thick twigs and hickories make these nuts most of the nuts you can eat they're pretty good and if you don't know what catkins are i catkins is in here several times there this is the flowers these are catkins all right and yellow poplars are state tree uh you tell this by its strong trunk you know if you think about um the royalty of the forest in tennessee yellow poplar oaks um and uh, uh american beach are are kind of the the royalty stuff like um sourwood and persimmon are the jesters they're they're the goofy crazy ones and and Cherry's like a, a bishop. It's a little bit goofy, but it can be kind of royal. Anyway, yellow poplar trees have a strong, powerful, like this picture. And usually they have a fairly thin crown. Although open grown trees, we, we've got an open grown one in our backyard and it's got limbs that uh, you can make lumber from. So it's, it's odd. But the characteristic that's most powerful for me about yellow poplars is duck billed bud and this smooth twig. You can see <coughs> and and in person, when I'm in person, I always scratch and sniff these twigs. If you smell the twig of a yellow poplar, it smells like nothing else. It's a really pleasant smell and, and you cannot forget it. So I scratch and sniff stuff to uh, to make sure, but but usually you can tell by the form of the tree and the stateliness of it that it's a yellow poplar. All right. So we've blasted through kind of how I see the world, looking at it from far off to up close. And, and I promise you, I've been driving around looking at trees, explaining crap to Cindy and trying to figure out if, if this really runs true a lot of times or if you just have to look to see it. But that's my strategy. Think about trees, eliminate what it's not, and you go through that checkbook and then identify what, what might it be, the three possibilities. So revisit the goal or goals that you had for our session tonight. Hopefully you met your goal.
Um, there has been some wonderful stuff going on in the chat. I love that you folks are helping each other and fostering learning for one another. Uh, together, we know a lot of information all together. Here are a set of resources that might be useful to you. So again, this might be a screenshot or a picture that you would want to take. And I know that the um, session is recorded and will be stored on uh, the Native Plant Society website. So you'll be able to go back through it and, and skip to sections that you're particularly interested in if there are any. So, so if you've never tried um, using your phone to identify things, this Picture This app is phenomenal. We, we went to North Dakota as one of our trips this year. And we're putzing around out in the prairies looking at stuff. And picture this tells us what it is. And uh, and it will do trees, it will do flowers, it will do grasses. It's phenomenal. And I swear the algorithm in that, the first question it asks itself is, where are you? <laughs> What's your habitat? What's it like? What's the location? What's the location? A picture of this is like way cool. It is, it is really neat. But these other documents, there's a million things about dendrology. This Virginia Tech, um, if you really want to want to learn how to do it, this Virginia Tech dendrology is, is awesome. But picture this will get you, you don't have to learn it. Just point and click your phone and it'll tell you what it is. So we're over time. All right. Miss Karen. All right. Uh, thank you. Lots of good information. Tremendous amount of information. I know it's a lot to take in, but I'll I will, uh, as I've said twice now in the in the chat, the material is being recorded. The whole thing is recorded. Slides, conversation, um, the, the talk. It's all recorded and will be posted by the end of the week on our TNPS website. Just go to tnps.org and on the drop down menu, look for seminars. It will be on the seminar page. Okay, as I've done with, uh, as we've done with all of our seminars so far, there is a recording for it. So, um, so Karen, we have time if, your Zoom meeting has time left in it. We don't mind answering some questions if folks have them. So I realize that people may be limited in the time that they have, but we'll hang around for a bit if you'd like for us to. Super. There are some questions in the, in the chat, but we probably want to hit. Um, I like it. Any, any burning questions that you must have an answer to? May I, May I talk? I Yes. Okay. I'm Alice Jensen, and uh, I practically grew, literally grew up with a love, love of trees uh, from, my, from my childhood, from my father, and got many pictures of that. But then I came to this country and to my property, and in my property, as you were giving your report, I had uh, practically... Uh, uh, comments to every tree you mentioned, almost. They're not all growing exactly here on Horse Mountain, but an um, interesting, uh, so I got, I'm pointing out two favorites. One is the sassafras tree. When the sassafras tree gets old, real old, then the big branches will break off with a large eye, they leave an eye on it. And you can take that piece of, take that piece of wood and varnish it and it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, so, so you can see, uh, so I call that part of my woods, my sassafrases. And, uh, and they have, uh, uh, they have fallen and so, and also uh, you cannot, uh, uh, it, do not try to dig up a, a sapling of a sassafras because the root is endless. And uh, that's, that's about it. And another one of my favorites is Gymnocladus dioicos, the Kentucky coffee tree. And uh, 
I uh, had some growing and they had to uh, put, the, put the power line through it, through the shoots. But I got three, uh, three of them have been planted for me. And an interesting thing is when they have their foliage, uh, as they are of the uh, pea family, uh, they and their leaves are the most fascinating leaves because one leaf is endlessly big because it's double pinnated. And, uh, and, and you have hot sunshine in the daytime, those pins, when they are normally uh, normally sitting sitting flat like this, they will all turn like that, so they uh, get less sun, and uh, and they can uh, live better in the heat. Very cool. And uh, so I could continue with about uh, almost every tree that you mentioned, but. Uh, I think that would be a talk for, for an hour or two. Okay, Ms. Karen. All right. Uh, one, and the questions, do some oaks hold leaves more than others? Yes. I think so, yeah. Yeah, some some drop them. But, but um, what species hangs on to them the most? The white um, hang longer? Which one? The sumac, the sumac oak hangs, hey, hangs right long. Can I say something? Yes. Yes. Um, I think bamboo is kind of um maybe poisonous, um, and because not so many um plant eaters can eat bamboo, so I think bamboo is poisonous. Bamboo. Bamboo. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know about bamboo. But I think it's poisonous because not many animals can eat it. So it's poison. I'm just a well, it can be poisonous. Kid. Yeah, I'm just a six year old kid. And I you're think doing it's very well because I saw that in a real life movie. <laughs> Sometimes plants are poisonous to one animal, but not to another. Yeah, I think that, some that's is... why um only um because that's why um one of the only um a plant eater who can eat it is the panda. That's one of the only that's... ones. Right, animals that grow up with the, with certain plants usually don't have to worry about them being poisonous. The poisonous ones are usually the invasive ones, the ones that have been that that were that got started in a different part of the world, and when they brought are brought to our country to our yards, it can be poisonous to many of our local animals. Um, Sometimes we eat bamboo shoots, so people humans do. So um, yeah, just don't eat a bunch, I guess. <laughs> Some acorns are poisonous and some aren't to humans, to humans. And that's just because of the quantity of, of what? Um, tannins, tannins in the acorns are, are the big deal. And so, so Native Americans ate, and, and early, early settlers ate uh, white oak acorns, um, soak them in water, you can make a, a flour with it and they're high in a protein. So they're not delicious. So. I want to say something again. Okay. Um. So, um, some, um, like animals and trees are kind of alike because they work kind of together for like, like, like insects. They're still animals, so they help a tree grow. So some help other plants live. So some animals help trees live. You are right, ma'am. You are going to be a scientist when you grow up. Keep studying those trees, okay? You can be a forester. <laughs> yeah, I know that because I'm a little scientist. My mom is a 
science, but not a tree sciences man. We have a forest and I know that because I know my dad told me um, animals help. Very good, very good. Miss Karen, it's your turn what again. What questions do we have? All right. Um, comments, uh, ash and box elder are toughies. I think they're referring to the bark. Uh, black cherry bark looks like cornflakes glued onto the trunk. <laughs> that is a very good description, yes. <laughs> Dark cornflakes, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I had a question, if you all don't mind. Sure. Yes, uh, this is Dorian Owens from uh, Atlanta, uh, actually at the Georgia Department of Transportation. Um, question was, have you all had any, seen any kind of changes in terms of the length of, uh, in, of time that, say, a trees in general have been holding their leaves longer due to climate change in any way you know so in other words are they holding their leaves longer or are they about the same have you all noticed any kind of changes in that regard just a quick question thank you you know i think um people are tracking the onset of spring the timing of spring um and mapping out when leaves appear but i don't know about if anybody's sweating the holding on uh, of of the dead leaves or the the brown leaves but i would bet that the same people that are mapping out early onset of spring are also working on the fall and so so we know over history that that the world is shifting that the climate's been changing for a long time and uh certain species are moving farther north um but but i think um there's a there's a whole bunch of people mapping out how how quick things are blooming in the spring can i tell something again um we're just doing you, questions right now if you just um let somebody else have a turn it would be good Okay. Thank you. Um, tulip poplar fruit clusters need a fun short descriptor like the elm saucers and the ash paddles. If anyone has a good one, let me know to help learners remember when they see those clusters on a bare tree. This is by uh, Joanna Brochetta. So any, any suggestions for a better name for tulip poplar fruits? Somebody in the chat uh, mentioned calling them cones. They're not true cones, but they do kind of look like a cone and that they, they peel away like the, um, like the layers of a cone do. So I don't know other than that. Another question is the oaks I see have gnarled right angle branching structure. Is this common? You know, so Cindy and I were talking about this earlier. So um, the right angle branch that I'm supposing that you're talking about the angle that the first branch coming off of the trunk is and, and so some do. And I think um, the plants that are adapted to more moist soils or floodplains tend to have a flatter branch pattern and a tighter crown. So like a nut all oak would have a, 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 a shallower branch angle than some of the upland oaks. So I think that happens. Um, and, and so our pin oak trees that you see, they have branches coming up, but then they all, they go down. Pin oak is a, a is a net, it's naturally connected to lower sites, the sites that are, uh, moister closer to um, flooded waters and we tend to we tend to uh, use those trees to plant in urban spaces because those trees tolerate the absence of oxygen they can tolerate flooded areas so we move them into um, the urban areas where the soil is disturbed and the and the um, the fluffiness of it limits the oxygen to it so they work on our and and when we dump salt, 
um, on our roads, they can tolerate that more than the upland oaks. So that's why we use them as street trees. Okay. Um, a lot of nice compliments here. Very practical. Learn more than on a four hour hands-on winter ID hike. This is very helpful. Thank you. Another one. Very good presentation. After seeing this, I'm now hearing the Star Wars refrain. You have much to learn, my young bad one. Yes. <laughs> um, question how does picture this compare to seek i'm not familiar with seek. what seek. these will be two apps i'm sure so i'm not familiar with seek this app, is, but i'm definitely going to look at it seek is part of i'm sorry i have a uh, my sister's chihuahua is having a meltdown um the um it's part of iNaturalist actually it's a uh, um and it's free whereas you have to pay for picture this and it, but what it does is um, you just point your camera at it and it um, sometimes it can tell you and it can tell you immediately, but if you're not internet connected, it can't always do the, you know, like the, the remaining 5% of the ID. But um, I have, sometimes it's wrong. And the more, you know, the more, the more often, you know, that it's wrong, <laughs> but it's free. And it's, and I think that it gives information to iNaturalist. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but it gives you a list of your species and you, you, you know, you positively identify them. And I think that it puts the, you know, it may put location markers and stuff on it like it does with iNaturalist. So I was just curious if one was better than the other, but. I, yeah, I don't, I mean, yeah. picture this is amazing. It, it, yeah, we are, I don't yeah, we don't out. pay for anything. We're cheap, but but that's <laughs> worth having, man. It can, is, can it is not very expensive. It is it's just cool. a moment. Can I say something? Just a moment. Let's let a few others. Or, or unless you're are you do you know about these two programs? Which two? We're talking about seek and picture this. Do you have you used them? No, but I can say something. If you want to know more, you need to, and if you want more trees on the planet and help the trees, um, you could, so maybe try to do less gas if you want more trees. Yes. Okay. Um. Another compliment here, much better than reading a book to figure out how to ID winter trees. Well done. So, uh, comment here is picture this is sometimes wrong. Another comment, picture this is great. I have the premium version and think it's definitely worth it. Um, Lots of thank yous for a great presentation, great tips. Um, let's see, any more questions here? Thanks for sharing your knowledge. I could say more questions. Okay. Because I know I can say questions or answers for things. What do you not know? Maybe I know the answer. <laughs> you must be a very smart six-year-old. <laughs> yeah, I'm already in first grade. All right. One of the things we learn in school is that the more we learn, the more we realize we have a lot more to learn. Um, and I, know, I know how the moon gets its forms. That's for another talk, not for this one. This one we're going to talk about trees. If anybody, if anybody lives uh, uh, near near to uh, Bedford County or so, and uh, I will be uh, uh, would be glad to give a give a tour of Horse Mountain and uh, and its trees and. Uh, <laughs> 
So, uh, so if you want to see the real thing and not just along the highway or on the computer. All right. Thank you, Alice. Uh, Mary Mitchell asks, are there good arboretums near Nashville? And I'm trying to think of them. Do you know of any, Dave? So Vanderbilt, somebody put in the comments, Vanderbilt's got um, got a lot of trees tagged. Um, um, yeah, and uh, MTSU's got some tagged. Um, Ellington Ag Center's got trees tagged. Um, but uh, what's the Cheekwood? Holy smokes. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got true. Cheekwood is, is like really cool. Um, but um, so a lot of the parks have trees tagged. Um, 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 what's the lake? Um, that, James Ford? No, that in Nashville that feeds the uh, railroad, Radnor. Uh, yeah, they've got trees marked too. I do know MTSU has a downloadable guide where their trees on campus are marked and they have the GPS coordinate, common and scientific name and some other information. So you can find that through MTSU. Wow. So I, I used the Vanderbilt one, it's online. And, and I was chasing one kind of tree I wanted to see. I was not very familiar with it. I wanted to go look at it. And so uh, I found out where it was on the, but my gosh, it's a zoo trying to find your way into that place. <laughs> you, you've got you've to gotta park, park three miles away and, and navigate through holes to get there. But, but Vanderbilt has a cool one, yep. Which tree was it? I can't remember now. Okay. Can I say something? Is if you a have a question. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, how did um, actually trees um, get so long like some of them are mm, as long as you can make tunnels? for cars so cars can go through. Yeah, that's a big tree. That's a big yeah, tree. How can, how can those ones grow? And if you make the tunnel, it doesn't break. Yeah, so the middle of the trunk part is usually dead wood. So it's, it can, it's not alive in the inside of the tree anyway. So that's how that works. But they can't cut all of it, just a little bit. Okay, and I have a, an answer to a question earlier. Joanna Bruschetto says, uh, I, just, I just checked and bud burst does track leaf drop. Budburst.org, that's the organization I'm familiar with for community science phenology data. So there's an answer to that one. Um, and in, in about the bamboo, pandas do eat bamboo, but the ones at Zoo Atlanta have discovered they prefer our only native bamboo, which is called river king. There are some specialist animals that eat river king, several insects, for example. Okay. And there is a specialist mouse called the cane rat that nests only in cane breaks about six to eight feet off the ground. So, and there's an article in the, about cane breaks in the Tennessee Naturalist magazine that came out in July, August. Uh, oh, the Swanee campus is an arboretum also. That's, oh, that's right, yeah. That's not near, not real close to Nashville, but would be helpful for a lot of folks. I believe there is, I believe there's one in White House. Okay. They were at uh, at one time uh, uh, represented at the Lawn and Garden Show years ago, and uh, I can't remember the name right now. But uh, they do everything, everything themselves. So they they don't have uh, hired help, but uh, but they have the the tree the trees and the trees are named and so I never never did get to get there yet over the years but uh, it, so okay. I um, could find out more of who that was. Okay 
One more comment that says uh, iNaturalist app can help ID plants and animals via AI. The suggested ID produced by the AI is checked and corrected by human experts through crowdsourcing. The GPS location data embedded in smartphone photos is submitted and captured, used for research and shared with other organizations. Apps like EDD maps, which land managers use to map invasive species. So that's a strong little tidbit of information. Um, thank you, Nick Douglas, for that. Of all the, of the books that TNPS has access to, this one, Woody Plants of Kentucky and Tennessee, is a is a good guide by uh, uh, Jones and Wofford. And now for those that don't have it yet, just contact us at TNPS. We can supply you some. And there, there Probably is at the law, the National Lawn and Garden Show will be a good place to pick up copy. Can I say something? Yes. What is your name? Hmm? What is your name? Robert. Robert. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Yes, go ahead. Um, how um, can trees um, get so... How could the oldest tree get more than 9,000 9, years old? The oldest tree, whatever lived. How? And how did it not fall down? Ooh, that's a tough one for you, Dave. You know, Robert, that is going to be your dissertation um, <laughs> when you go to college. I want you to study that and tell us exactly how that works because trees and a lot of plants have tons and tons of secrets that we are trying to figure out every day. Our best scientists are trying to figure it out. And they don't really know all the answers. So when you get big and you go to college, that will be a good one for you to study and tell us when we're very old. So you don't know what the answer? That is exactly right. <laughs> and I want you to find out. Go back say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you See, bet. Even adults don't have all the answers. I'm finished. Yeah. Very Thank good, you, Robert. Robert. You're a smart little fellow. Maybe we'll hear you at another one of our seminars. Or is trees your special interest? Well, we can apply to MIT. So. Okay. Um, all right, everyone. So Any you guys have questions? been awesome to each other uh, in answering your questions. I'm so looking back guess. through the uh, chat. through the chats now, and uh, sorry if you don't like yellow poplar or tulip poplar. That's that's your problem. <laughs> uh, if you call it a magnolia, it's a magnolia. You're going to irritate people, and you might as well be irritated that it's. I called it a red cedar because it's a juniper, and you can nag <laughs> people about that too. <laughs> Common names are way fun. There, there are some, some that I can tell you stories about that are way fun. Yeah, so thanks. You guys have been awesome to each other to help through this. Very impressive. Well, we appreciate you guiding us and leading us through. For so many of us, you've given us tips and techniques that we can apply as soon as we go outside our back doors. And uh, I know I will be looking around very carefully tomorrow. And I have a couple trees out back that I'm kind of wavering on what it is. And these tips will help a lot. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, Robert? Um, um, I can say I know um, how pandas can adjust. Mm -hmm. um, bamboo because and because it's poisonous only a couple can but i know how they can digest it they just have a really short one and different type of microbe 
Well, that's a possibility. Yeah. That, that's another research project. <laughs> you could do that when, when you're in high school, maybe. Mm -hmm. that's a genius. Research is fun. And that's what a lot of the people, other people here have done. They do, we do our research on things. And then we turn to people like mm -hmm. Mr. Dave and, and Dr. Cindy, and we learn more. They give us ideas on how we learn more. I learn more about Legos. So that's also something how to get, learn more about le, how to build Lego. Yes. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Robert, and good night. And everyone yeah. else, are there any further questions about trees? It's already over my sleeping time. Oops. <laughs> so those people that were asking about uh, Arboretum, uh, uh, Michelle is on um she's at the arboretum uh in oak ridge there's a huge place a huge research arboretum there it's an amazing place so if you've never been to oak ridge arboretum go there okay so lots of tips techniques ideas places to look places to go thank you dave and cindy thank you so much for the opportunity we have enjoyed this immensely David Waters, do you have an email address? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My email is Dave dot or Dave Walters76 at bellsouth.net. Would you repeat that? Dave? Put it in chat. Yeah. He's gonna put I'll it in it. chat for you, but okay. Alice. All right. Any other questions from anyone? Well, I don't see it. <laughs> there it is now. Dave Walters, seven, 76 right. at Bell South. Okay, thank you. All right, good night, everyone. All right, good night. And thank you so much for thanks coming. For, thanks for inviting us. Indeed. Bye.